in my career in the pharmaceutical company changed my life and that that at one point the company that I joined or actually the company that was a result of a merger between two companies um, ended up suing Nelson Mandela over the price of HIV medicines for um, South Africans and and I thought to myself what am I doing here you know what why do I want to be someplace which is not going to allow people to have medicines that need the medicines? And, and it, fortunately, I was on the board of directors, so I was able to convince the board that this is not the kind of company we wanted to be and that we had to do something very clearly, directly, dramatically to change the image that we've created of a company that was so greedy that they would charge South Africans prices they couldn't afford for the medicines they desperately needed. So we created a, a, a laboratory for diseases of the developing world. And this laboratory focused just on malaria and TB. And, and I'm, I'm happy to say that from this low state to where we are today, this laboratory now accounts for almost two-thirds of the entire pipeline for new malaria medicines and new TB medicines for the whole world. Understand that over a period of 30 years, there were roughly 3,500 medicines that were registered, of which only 17 were actually directed primarily at diseases of the developing world. And from that point to having the rich pipeline we have today required the commitment of one company and many others who have followed since then. Then, of course, I met Bill and Melinda, and their passion really has drew, driven me to where I am today. Well, <clears throat> what does it look like in the developing world? I can tell horrible stories. I'm not sure it's useful to hear the stories that you can well imagine. But I'll tell you one, and then I'll tell you more about it. So let's talk about malaria in Africa. One of, one of the, the first lessons I learned was uh, uh, my first trip to Africa as part of the foundation. I uh, visited the southern part of uh, Mozambique, uh, an area called Manhisa, and it's very malaria-rich. Literally hundreds and thousands of babies die in this area every year from malaria. And um, what was really quite remarkable to me was I went to a sub-district hospital and in the emergency room, um, there was a mother and a baby. And I know what a sick baby looks like. And this baby was pretty sick, but not much sicker than many babies I've seen in an intake area. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, this baby probably is going to be admitted and the baby will be all right. And I was given a tour of other parts of the hospital. And by the time I got to the pediatric ward, this baby was there. And was desperately sick, breathing at 150 per minute. Now, I, I challenge you to try to breathe at 150 per minute. <laughs> this is how the baby was breathing. And, and so in a short time from going from a looking like a sick baby to being a desperately ill baby, what I realized was my, many babies in Africa live on a thin line between life and death. They have so many other problems that when they get something that sets them over the edge, in this case, this baby probably had all kinds of parasitic diseases, was iron deficient to begin with, and then they get malaria, a little bit more hemolysis, and all of a sudden this baby can't oxygenate enough to survive. And so it's trying to compensate for this lack of oxygen by breathing inefficiently at a high rate. Well, that's the desperate side of the story, and we hear so many, but there are some really hopeful, important stories here, too. So another story I can tell you about is um, in Abuja, which is the capital of Nigeria, <coughs> I visited a slum area called Mpape. And, and here, it's a very typical slum, I went to the health clinic. And the health clinic had a nurse and an assistant and two community health workers Dirt floor, no plumbing, no furniture, no medicine. So I said, well, 
you know, how do you deal with patients here? Well, they don't come here. So there's a health clinic. Why would you go somewhere where there's no medicine? But within 200 yards of this health center were literally dozens of small pharmacies. They're, in some countries, they're called chemical sellers. These are people actually that can get medicines. They're, their shelves are lined with medicine, and this is where people go. So they go to the clinic, they get their medicine, they pay their money, and, and they go home. And they often have a little clinic next door, not a clinic, but an examining area, a consultation area, if you will, where, it concentrate, where diagnosis is made. Now I ask these people, well, now, what, do you give for, what do you give for malaria? Well, we give chloroquine. Now, mind you, about 50% of the malaria in that region is chloroquine resistant, so it's not very helpful. But chloroquine only costs 15 cents. The right treatment, artemisinin combination treatments, are about $7. And I said, well, that's when we started to figure out what we needed to do to bring that price down. So that informed us to create this uh, initiative called the Affordable Medicines Facility for Malaria where we've negotiated the pharmaceutical companies to bring the price down to a dollar. And then we have a subsidy that subsidizes 85 cents more that goes to the wholesaler, and the wholesaler then trickles that incentive down to the retailer. So now this facility makes the cost of the right medicine equal to the wrong medicine. And you know what? The pharmacists know, and so they will, they will give the right medicine. I say, you know, I hear there are counterfeits around here. Do you have counterfeits? They say, oh, yes, we do. I said, how do you know you don't have a counterfeit? He says, the patients tell me. If it doesn't work, they'll come back and tell me. So you're darn right. I care if it's a counterfeit or not. Now, another vignette I can tell you about is uh, outside the city of Lusaka in Zambia, or another place where there's a big malaria problem. And here... Um, in this place called the Chelstone Clinic, a catchment area of around 100,000 people, there was one rotund but wonderful nurse. Uh, she wasn't really a nurse, but she was, a, I guess, a, a, not a registered nurse, but maybe the equivalent of a nurse's assistant in the U.S., but she was the nurse for this community. She knew every single one of the patients in her community. And I asked her how things were going. She says, pretty well. I said, well, you know, how many bed nets do you think they, you have in your catchment area for malaria? And she said, well, we probably have, uh, you know, uh, maybe 2,000 in 100,000 people. I said, how many of them are using their bed nets? Oh, probably only about 20% or so. I said, well, is there any spraying around here? Well, yeah, some areas where people are close quarters, they do some spraying. But I said, well, what's happened with malaria here? And she said, I, don't, I haven't seen any child die for over six months. I said, well, how many do you used to see? Dozens. So what this is to say is that imperfect tools, imperfectly applied, work. And so... Mozambique in the last three years has had a reduction in malaria incidence measured by looking at parasites in the blood of 50%. All-cause child mortality in Mozambique has fallen by almost a third in just a couple of years. So it's not all hopeless out there. Things do work. People are actually doing difficult things to try to address this problem of child mortality. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that the situation isn't hopeless by any means from the standpoint of people's involvement in their own problems and how to solve them in a creative way. And I want to go to the problem of, of, um, uh, of the poor in South Asia, slightly different than Africa. So we have a big program in AIDS prevention in India called Avahan. And this is focused on the three at-risk populations, IV drug abuse, which is relatively modest in India still, uh, uh, men who have sex with men, again, relatively modest cause in India, 
but female sex workers, a big problem. So the program is focused on, on empowerment, allowing a woman to say, hey, I want safe sex, and I demand it. And, and, and the kind of power it has, in fact, when I visited one of the sites, was they said, well, you know, policemen used to harass us all the time, but now we have a whistle. When the policeman harasses, we have a whistle, we have a cell phone, and all of a sudden we can get 15 or 20 of our colleagues and we can make enough noise that the policeman becomes somewhat intimidated and they back off. It's about empowerment to do the right thing. Now the other interesting story is the one of community health workers in Bangladesh. Bangladesh has really been one of those countries that has pioneered community health workers. And it was mostly in the urban settings where people would volunteer as, uh, uh, to help mothers uh, deliver babies, to do the right things in the antenatal period, to do the right things after the baby was born. We wanted to move this program into the rural areas, uh, from the rural areas to the urban areas. In the rural areas, it was enough for these people to volunteer, and all they needed was one loan. And a loan allowed them to get a sewing machine. They could make saris. They could make a business out of it. So a microfinance loan was enough to have these volunteers. Now, when they moved into the cities, I was worried that this might not work because it's a little bit different. Well, it turned out all you had to do was to go to two loans because then the husband could get a rickshaw. And the rickshaw, then there'd be two incomes. And so in this kind of very market-related way, people can be incentivized to be part of the army of health workers that's needed to make a difference in the developing world. Now, the other really interesting story is uh, in, in uh, Uttar Pradesh, which is really one of the poorest parts of all of India, if not all of the world. I've seen more destitution there than just about anywhere else I've been. But this is one of the last outposts of polio. And <clears throat> India has a, a, a huge problem. This, this state of Uttar Pradesh is uh, 300 million people. It's not a state, it's like a country. This state has 2,000 physicians, right? So, I mean, the, the ratio is, is not good. And, and yet, this state has something in the order of 40 or 50 or 60,000 quacks. Now, when you think of a quack, right, you think of a faulty doctor. But in India, these quacks, uh, you know, this, I saw a recent case of polio, a young child with polio. And I said, who diagnosed this baby? The quack. So I went to see the quack. This quack came from a lo long line of quacks. <laughs> really, it was a family tradition. They specialized in neurological disorders. He knew the difference between Guillain-Barre syndrome and polio. Was one of the, the savviest neurologists I've met. And, it, and he wasn't paid for this. He did it because this was a profession that was handed down. He actually had a farm. That was how he made his living. But that does give you hope because there are people out there not the traditional physician or the nurse, people who know what they're doing and how we can capitalize them, uh, on them is really the big challenge for us in global health. Now, the other thing I do want to point out is the importance of American policy and what American policy can do. Just because it's out there doesn't mean the things we do here don't affect what happens. I'll tell you three stories. One is the story of rotavirus. Rotavirus, some of you may have heard of it. Well, diarrhea kills about three million babies a year. And a third of those causes is probably rotavirus. So a million babies die from rotavirus infection. Now, a vaccine was developed